envious of them, and I thought maybe there's something to this. And uh, so then, then I found that the same kind of experience and felt the same kind of feelings, and that's what that's what sucked me in. It wasn't you know some intellectual exercise. Um, it became that later on to make sure that my beliefs were true. I, I, I spent a lot of time in Christian apologetic books and kind of classic Christian literature t- um, with, with minds that are far greater than mine to, to sh- kind of shore up my, my faith. Um, but it, initially it was, it was an emotional um, experience. Yeah, and it was an emotional experience that moved you out. Um, yeah, it was the same kind of thing. It was, um, it was a... Uh, Several different uh, incidents, um, really hundreds of different incidents that uh, were just kind of put dents in my faith and, and made me start to doubt it. And then, you know, ironically, I, I did the same kind of thing. I, I went around trying to shore up my faith and um, trying to gather evidence that it was true. But this time, I was looking at through it through a slightly different. So, sort of someone that, that's just gained his faith and wants to. Uh, once I learned about it, it was sort of someone that was questioning his faith and, and let's gather some evidence to shore it up. And everywhere I looked, um, the evidence pointed in the other direction, which was quite a surprise for me. Uh, on page two, 273 of your book, uh, you, you quote an email you received from a church-going mother after you told your story in, in the LA Times. And she talks about, we lost our 10-year-old child to cystic fibrosis and felt betrayed, you know, by God, um, which is, is a very common feeling among other people in your book and, and in the, the world in general. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting to me that when other people were losing their 10-year-old children to cystic fibrosis, this woman wasn't feeling betrayed by God. It's only when it happens to them. Yeah, well, that's like life, isn't it? It's... Um my kid, uh, my teenager got uh, diabetes and, and, um, a couple years ago, and I always, uh, you know, I knew it was, um, you know, not a great thing to have, and, you know, I didn't really understand it. It's not until he got it that you really understand kind of the horror of, of the disease and, and uh, how tough it is on a kid. And, and so I think that, um, I think answers are much more simple when they're in the abstract than when, you know, when it happens to you. It's like when you have a gay, you know, a gay son and you're, you know, really against homosexuality and then all of a sudden you have to really re-examine your, your, um, your thoughts and values on it. I was at a Jewish retreat two weeks ago and a, a Jewish sitcom writer who, who became Orthodox talked about his relationship with God and how God helped him find parking spaces. <laughs> I read that in your blog. Oh, okay. I mean, that is the most obnoxious narcissism. Um, you know, I... <laughs> and, and, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and just seems... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it just seems that so much of what you're describing in the book is people being religious when religious religion works for them and then religion stops working for them and they start doubting their faith. It's like it's... it's efficacious or not I, I would um i'd view that a little bit differently I, I i think that the vast majority of people that are religious um give god you know all the credit in the world when things go right including you know find a parking place and um and he gets none of the blame when things go wrong and that just that just always drove me crazy it, it, it seemed like it was um um, you know, I would love that job where I get all the praise if things go right, and you know, it's it's none of the blame when things go wrong. Um, and I th- and I think also that one of the I think one of the reasons why my book and the original article that was in the Times resonated with so many people is that I think a lot of people have these kind of even you know very religious people have these kind of doubts, but they're just not allowed to talk about them. It's culturally. Um, I think actually I think it's better in Judaism than Christianity, but you know culturally, um, you know you're not allowed to really doubt too much, um, and the answers are all very pat. And I think that when someone comes out like me that says, you know, look, I you know I had these tremendous doubts, these haunted me, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that that people like to even if they're still Christians, you know, they still like to read read it because um, I mean w- one of the places I get I'm getting booked the most in is churches. They want to hear the story. Wow. 
Yeah, so that's kind of a gen. Do you think that's a generational change? Like a generation or two ago, I suspect you would not be getting booked in churches. I do. I think that um, I think the people that are first of all, I think um, yeah, let's just take Christianity. I think Christianity is, um, and I even say Judaism too to, to a large extent, but it's it's been watered down so much um, in, in many of the denominations that. Um, you know, people sense that there's not a whole lot there. It's it's more of a something to do on a Sunday and to meet some friends, but uh, for the rest of the week, they're not really living out the the, the radical messages that are in the Gospels, for instance. And um, I think that uh, if they if they would do that, they'd probably lose a lot of people. But I think the faith would be much more authentic. That's, that's why I'm always drawn. Um, or like much better the people on the the far right or far left of either faith because any kind of faith because they really act out as though you know um, their scriptures are are real and not kind of this mushy um, luke lukewarm uh, mush in the middle. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father is probably Seventh Day Adventism's best known ex Seventh Day Adventist. Uh, we moved out of the church when I was fourteen and. One of his students went on to do a PhD in sociology, and the thesis of his thesis was that if you have fewer than half a dozen friends at your particular house of worship, you're likely to move on. And if you have more than that, um, you're likely to stay. Um, How much did friendships play a role in your religious journey, both into and out of religion? Um, well, they certainly did into. I, I, I was uh, quickly surrounded by uh, a great group of friends who are still my friends today. We have we had um, weekly Bible study. Um, I really enjoyed them and their company and, you know, got to know their families and everything else. Um, so that was good. And that was part, part of the hard part about leaving is I didn't want you know I, my whole life was centered around this this world and and I felt like uh, it was very hard to come to grips with the fact that I just didn't believe this anymore and it took me it took me about four years to really um, you, you know since when I look back on it I you know I lost my faith um, around 2002 and it took me until 2006 to um, admit to myself that you know what I just don't believe this anymore I, I wish it were true I wish this was so but I've got to um, be honest and say that you know the light switch has gone off and it's 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 not there anymore um, and there was one person um, uh, Julia Sweeney from the um, old Saturday Night Show she was Pat who did a one one woman play called Letting Go of God and it was that play that. I, I didn't even know. I, I knew what it was about, obviously, from the title. I really didn't know what it was about. And uh, I sat there on the edge of my seat in this little theater in, in um, Hollywood, and just uh, it was like she was speaking right to me. And I, and I knew then it was okay if I if I became an atheist uh, or if I was an atheist. And uh, up until that point, I was I felt like I was all alone. Hmm. This is before the uh, new atheist movement with you know Hitchens and Dawkins. Right. And, right. So it just wasn't really talked about. And what's what's really funny is when I first decided to write this this essay for the Times, I I originally thought, well, maybe this could be a book. And and so I called a couple of agents, and they said, oh, books on atheism would never sell in America. Um, like eight of them said that, and then within about six months, you know, the three of them are at the top of the bestseller list. But I think that shows there there is a real hunger out there for people to to talk in uh, real terms and, and, and honestly about faith and matters of faith. And I imagine a lot of Christians and others, other people of faith have bought those books to kind of get the other side of things that they're not getting in, in their churches or, or synagogues. Did you lose friends when you switched churches? And did you lose friends when you left the church? Um, didn't lose friends when I switched churches. Did lose a couple of friends when um, when I left uh, the faith. They thought that I was, especially because I spoke out about it um, eventually, um, they thought I was doing damage to the body of Christ and I was um, either 
you know, a troubled person that was that was 